Preparing for this talk uh, was a little bit uh, tricky because I was like, wow, it's 10 years, I should talk about something special. Maybe I should look back and I was like, well, I can't possibly talk about everything that happened to the Elixir community in, 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 in like 50 minutes or something. So, uh, so what I decided to do is that uh, I team up, teamed up with the folks at the Thinking Elixir podcast and I recorded five episodes with them talking about how the Elixir, the language, focus on the language, and how the language has changed since 1.0, so not covering the whole 10 years, because the 10 years is when 0.5 came up, but uh, covering everything that happened uh, from 1.0 to Elixir 1.14, which is going to be the version that is going to be coming out. The release candidate hopefully is going to come out this month. And um, so yeah, so it's more like than five, five hours of content. So if you'd like to hear more about like why, what changed and how things changed, there's a lot of content in there. If you don't care about that, you just want to see, hey, what is new? You can check out the last episode, which talks about Elixir 1.13, which is the current one and the upcoming. So for this talk, I decided to talk about the future of Elixir and and I was thinking, well, this is also hard, right? Because if somebody asked me 10 years ago that we would be here and people would be using Elixir for a web, web I kind of expected, but people would be using Elixir for like building uh, embedded systems, data apps, doing auto video processing, uh, building distributed systems, I would not have like imagined that, right? So I was like, well, it's going to, it's going to be a fool's errand trying to, to guess what is the future of Elixir. But what I can do is that I can talk about my future with Elixir. And what I mean is that I can talk about the things that I'm excited, the things that I am planning to work on, work on with my colleagues at Dashbit. And I also hope that by sharing my future with Elixir, I can inspire you to do the same. And then throughout the conference, you can talk about, oh, what is your future with Elixir? And each of us, and the nice thing is that each of us is going to have a different future with Elixir, right? Different plans. Like if you're just getting started, maybe your future with Elixir is uh, starting doing Elixir full time, right? And that's great. So that's what I want to do, and that's uh, my proposal for us to talk about throughout the event, for example. And for me, particularly, there are three main areas of focus that I am very excited to, to, to work on. I have been working on some of those. Some of those you can already expect if you're following my work for the last year. But before we can get to this, before I can get to my three main areas of focus, we need to talk about the elephant in the room. And what is the elephant in the room? Any guesses? <laughs> uh, it's types, right? Because every time some, there is a discussion that says, hey, what would you like to have in Elixir? What is the number one answer? It's types. Last year at Elixir Conf, I asked who would like, and when I say types, to be more precise, I mean like static type checking, right? So having a type system start having uh, static type checking, more towards the direction of static type checking. So, and I even asked last year at Elixir Conf, right? And I asked it for a show of hands, and uh, I think the majority, more than 50%, said that they would like to go more in this direction. And I can, we can do the test here. Who would like Elixir to go more towards the direction of having more like static types or static type checking? Please raise your hand. Right. I, wait, 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 keep it, I have to, I'm, I have to count, no. Um, and here, who here would like not this to happen at all? It's like, it's perfect, don't touch it, like very few hands. And, he, and who here is like, well, I trust the Elixir team. Whatever they do, it's going to be, <laughs> it's going to be great. All right. So, um, so to me, this is the elephant in the room because every time we talk about the future, these will undoubtedly come up, right? So, I what I wanted to do is like, why would we want static types, right? And then I started talking to people, asking people, understanding what they're expecting to gain from it, and. And, it's, and you hear things that are like true, and they're like, I, they say, and they're like, yeah, I agree, you would definitely get with types. But I also hear a lot of things that are like not true. They're like, oh, I want types because I would get these. And they're like, hmm, 
I'm not quite sure that's actually what is going to happen. And I also hear things that are true but cannot possibly apply to Elixir. So what I want to do is that I want to talk about why would we want static types with a focus on Elixir because regardless if we are going to have types or not, we need to understand what we would get or what would be leaving on the table, right? So I want to try to address the elephant in the room and try to have a shared understanding or of what having static types for Elixir would mean or would not mean, okay? So why would we want static types? Some people can say, hey, for performance. Um, just feedback, can you read well at the back? Can you read performance? Okay. Uh, some people say, hey, for documentation, it improves the developer experience. Others say, well, we want it for code maintenance, it helps us catch bugs, it improves refactoring. Some people say that they like to use types as specifications. So for example, they would use types to declare their business rules, how their data should behave. Some people use types as a design tool. So I like, for example, if I'm writing a library, I, am a, I like to do documentation-driven development. I like to write documentation first, explain the flow, design the API through documentation. Uh, and some people that like to do test-driven development. Uh, and some people, if when you have types in the language, they like to do type-driven development. They write the types first to help them model. And I, maybe some people even do that using the type specs that we have in Elixir today. And sometimes we have types as proofs. Usually when you have a type system, right, especially when we say, hey, we want static types in Elixir, is because they want the types to prove something about the code, like want to assert some properties about the code. So those are the main points that I often hear. Um, there are a couple others, but those are the main ones. And we can go through this list and take the easy nose out, for example. Well, can types give you performance? Sure, but not for Elixir, because we run on top of the Erlang Virtual Machine. And unless we make the types go all the way down to the Erlang Virtual Machine, uh, which could be done, but would require a, a lot of work committed with the OTP team, for example, we are not going to get like performance benefits from having types. The good news, however, is that the Erlang OTP team has been working in the last years towards improving the types that it can get from pattern matching, that it can get from guards, into making your code more performant. So we already get some of this benefit through the annotations that you use today in, in your Elixir code from the features that you use today. But I don't think it's something that we would majorly get from uh, a type system, from having more static types. The other one is types and specification, right? And I want to show a quick example. So uh, sometimes, for example, imagine that you're working on your application, there is a user, and you start typing it. So here I'm using like the type spec notation that we have today. So you can say, I have a user struct. It has a field name that is a string, age is an integer, and address is a string as well. Having address is a string is a horrible idea, but it works for the, the point that I have to make. And, uh, and then you say, look, this is great. This is mapping exactly the data that I need. You know, so somebody can come, can look at this type and understand like, what the data looks like, what our kind of understand our business requirements and so on. And the issue with this is that it breaks like very, very quickly, right? So for example, imagine that this application, you can, uh, users that are less than 18 years old, uh, they can register as well. And if users that are less than 18 years old can register, you most likely need to have information, especially if you're going to have things like address, you need to have information about who is the legal guardian of this user. So now you're in the situation where, look, we added the guardian field, and we are saying like, this is going to be a guardian struct, or new, because if the user is more than, is more than 18 years old, they don't need this information. And now you can say, hey, this, does this map like the, my data, how my data should look like? It no longer does that, right? Because you can say that guardian is new, but the truth is, if the age is less than 18, you have a guardian, right? Otherwise, it's new. And you're really not encoding this room here. So uh, Rich Hickey, he actually, uh, the creator of Clojure, he actually talks a lot about this, right? And how it can be really misguided to think about uh, types as a specification of your data and encoding a more complex uh, domain and business rules in types. And, and I agree. And somebody could say, well, maybe what it means is that I should split this type in two types, right? One for users and then for users that are uh, less than 18 years old. But then you have to ask yourself, like, hey, is this the actual better design uh, for the system 
or are you just doing that to kind of accommodate limitations that you are getting from, from the types, right? So I agree, I don't think using types and specifications, it's, it's actually going to work in the long term. It's easily going to, to break. And, uh, and I don't mean this necessarily as a way to say, ooh, types is bad. I don't, I don't think this is like, it completely rules types out. But I think it's important for us to know that, you know, like if you're going down this path, it can be a potentially a bad path to go down on. So I don't think, personal opinion, I don't think type specification is a good choice and I don't think we would get that, uh, that out of it. Uh, so yeah, I think it's a no. And we can go for the easy, easy yes as well, right? So documentation, yeah, I think that's, so for example in Elixir we have type specs and the main purpose we use type specs in the Elixir code base itself is for documentation. It's really nice to look at the type spec and get a quick feedback of what are the inputs, what are the expected outputs, and so on. So, yeah, and so I think that's a yes. I think that's very easy. And as a design tool as well, right? If we have types in the language and people can express things with types, I can expect it being a design tool for more complex problems, starting with the types, and so on. So those are the easy no's, those are the easy yes. And uh, now we have like the, the, the part that it's not like, so, so easy to say, oh, it's a yes or, or a no, right? And I'm going to talk about right. So when we say about types as proofs, yes, types are usually proving something, but we need to understand what it is actually proving about our code, right? And the same comes with code maintenance, right? So um, for example, if you go to look like, oh, uh, types leads to fewer bugs, for example, it's something that we hear a lot, right? And then you actually go look at studies or papers, you are going to have a study that says, hey, we did a study with students and they had to build uh, the same system. One was using a static language, the other was using a dynamic language. And we can, in, in our study, the students that use a static language, a static type language, they had um, fewer bugs in their code, right? And then they explained the methodology. And then one year later, somebody published a paper on top of that paper saying, hey, we tried to replicate this study and it turns out that uh, it did not lead to fewer bugs and those that were using a static type system, they actually took longer to complete, right? So you have a lot of conflicting reports and there is a very recent paper um, that, um, that was published, which is types for code maintenance, oh, sorry, types for code maintenance, that's my title, ignore it. The important is this one, to type or not to type. A systematic comparison of the software quality of JavaScript and TypeScript applications on GitHub. And looking at JavaScript and TypeScript is interesting for us because it's a dynamic language that went the way of being a statically typed language, right, through TypeScript. And even though they are like, say, like, there are many differences, especially re related to types. So for example, in JavaScript, you can add w the number, numbers with strings, right, and you can't do that in Elixir. In Elixir, you're going to raise. But even then, there are probably a lot of important lessons to learn here. And in the introduction of the paper, when they, they summarize, like in the summary of the paper, and I recommend reading the paper for the whole nuance, the whole context, but I'm going to quote the introduction in here. Uh, the analyze indicates that TypeScript apps exhibit significantly better code quality and understandability than JavaScript apps. Contrary to expectations, however, bug proneness and bug resolution time of our TypeScript sample were not significantly lower than for JavaScript. And I put, significantly lower here in bold because that's what you hear sometimes, right? Like people say, hey, when you have a static type system, you have like significantly lower bugs, right? That's often like the hypothesis. Like, you know, I read somewhere uh, this week somebody saying that a type system would catch 80% of their bugs, right? So it's like, you know, um, a huge amount, right? In other words. But what they found in studies that the mean bug fix commit ratio was more than 60% larger uh, for TypeScript apps, so they had more big bug fixing commits. And TypeScript projects needed on average more than additional day to fix bugs. And you can have multiple reasons for that. Like maybe it takes more time because the easy bugs, they were caught by like the type system. That could be one of the possible reasons, right? And at the same time, they say, hey, you know, you have like um, better code quality. And sometimes the code quality is because the type system is going to help you find things like undefined functions, you use it variables, which all call towards bugs, towards the, the code quality, but those bugs is something that the Elixir compiler already catches, right? So, you know, 
And then they conclude, our results indicate that the perceived positive influence of TypeScript for avoiding bugs in comparison to JavaScript may be more complicated than assumed. While using TypeScript seems to have benefits, it does not automatically lead to less and easier to fix bugs. However, more research is needed in this area, especially concerning the potential influence of project complexity and developer experience. Right, so again, I recommend reading the paper uh, for all the nuance in there. And, um, and again, like you can find papers that are going to state the opposite of this, right? You can find studies that is going to reaffirm something along this direction, right? So the question is, is like, where does that lead us, right? I mean, we are obviously not going to be able to answer the question, to type or not to type, in this talk, right? So what can we do? And I think what we can do is that we can continue on this path and trying to, instead of trying to answer the question for real, for good, right? I think we can continue going down on this path of trying to understand what we could potentially get from types. Or, and what we can also do is that we can continue looking at the claims that we hear from people like, hey, you know, you should use types because you're going to get this and this and that, right? We can try to look at those claims also, see if they are true, see if they are false, try to make, uh, get some understanding of that so we can continue building this intuition of what we can gain from types, okay? So if we get a claim, for example, types with significantly lower bugs, uh, we can say, is it true or false? And I'm going to say, it's complicated. That's the, the, pa the word the paper uses. And I'm going to do a parenthesis. My personal opinion on this matter is that if it was significantly lower bugs, we would have like already concrete evidence at this point that would like people would not necessarily disagree with. If it was significantly lower bugs, I don't say it doesn't lead to lower bugs, but I'm saying that you know like when people say 80% of my bugs, like I'm like mm, I don't think that's the number, right? Um, but also at the same time, I don't think this is necessarily an interesting statement to be very honest, right? Because types lead to significantly lower bugs doesn't mean anything if I don't know what are the types of bugs that the type system uh, that I'm using is supposed to catch, right? So for example, this was the spoiler slide. So for example, if we look at the Rust compiler uh, and type system, it has very interesting properties. So Rust is a system language where you, you can like directly uh, allocate in the allocate memory. And the compiler the type system actually, like it's provable that it helps you uh, that catches bugs, right? So it helps you not deallocate memory twice. You cannot do that. The type system is going to yell at you. You cannot use the allocated memory. It avoids data racing threads. It avoids the engine pointers and many other properties. And it's provable, right? So this is an example where, yes, the type system is leading to, to lower bugs, right? But it's also important to understand that there are many other bugs that you can have in your software that is not going to fall under this, right? And the type system is not going to catch. And it's also important to understand that bringing all those properties from Rust type system to Elixir would not give us anything because we cannot have those bugs in the first place because the VM is taking care of allocating memory for us, right? We, already, we already have data mutability, so we're not so worried about data races and so on and so on and so forth. Right? So it's important to talk about, right? Like, what are the bugs that a type system can actually catch? And the other thing is that when you're talking about types for uh, code maintenance, there is also that we have to compare types with other tools that we use for code maintenance, for example, such as tests. And that's when I hear claims like this, like, types leads to fewer tests. Like, people say, oh, when I have a type system, I have to write fewer tests. And personally, I don't, I don't think this is true. I don't think this is true at all. Like, if you think this is true, like, you should really question what are the type, the kind of tests that are, that are writing, because there's a chance they're not really useful, right? Because types, when you have a type system, they're checking types, right? Our tests, they are called example-based tests. Most of the tests that we write, we have particular examples, and our examples are values that inhabit those types, so they're always more precise. So just to try to drive this point home, um, imagine, for example, that you have to implement a function called average that receives a list and returns a, a, the average of the numbers in that list. 
So I created this notation for types here just to get us out of the world of type specs, okay? I'm using the dollar sign because apparently that's how a programming language can make money. So it's like the dollar sign, <laughs> then you have then you have like a list of numbers, that's the input, and then you have the arrow as the number as output. And according to a type system, this is a completely doable, viable, correct implementation of the average function. Right? Your type system is not going to complain. You'll be like totally happy with that. Right? And your tests would most likely catch it unless all of your tests are giving like list where all the elements are equal to compute the average, which I think like we would, like, would not do, right? Um, so yeah, and then somebody can say, well, Jose, you need to pick this example just to prove your point. <laughs> and then I'm like, well, so let's get another function that is very simple, like Boolean, logical, and operator, right? It receives two Booleans and returns a Boolean, so if uh, both sides are true, it returns true, otherwise going to return false, um, here is also another perfectly reasonable implementation for AND according to a type system. So just get in any input and return a random one, right? And again, I think um, the point is, all, is exactly that, right? Like for the type system to be happy, we just need to return something that is going to inhabit that type, right? And that's enough. So I don't think this is true. I don't think types leads to fewer tests. And again, I'm not trying to poke fun at types, right? What, what I want is that, well, if we add a type system in Elixir in the future, I don't want to hear anybody saying, hey, I can write fewer tests now, right? Because if you're doing that, the software that you are delivering at the end is most likely worse, right? And also, is on the other side. Like, if we don't add a type system uh, to Elixir, I don't want everybody to say, oh, damn it, I have to write so many more tests now, right? No, that's not true, right? I don't think there is, I don't think types should change um, your approach to tests. And we also hear the opposite, right? We also hear that code coverage catches all bugs that types do. And code coverage can catch, if you have 100% code coverage, for example, which is not necessarily a goal, but if you have 100% code coverage, uh, you can catch bugs that a type system is not going to catch, is not going to catch. But the question is, can code coverage, co uh, can code coverage, it's almost like uh, those tongue twister, yes. Can code coverage catch uh, all the bugs <laughs> that types do, right? And because this is something that people say, they say, oh, I don't need a type system because I have 100% code coverage, right? So let's try to understand if this is true. Okay, so imagine that we have some function. It's not really important what this function is doing. It receives an argument. It calls another function that we don't know about in another module that could come from your project, from a dependency, doesn't matter. And we know that this another function returns a string. And then you get this string and you split it on the minus on the dash, okay? So you implement this function, you write some tests, it works, you ship it to production, if you execute this function once in your test, you're going to get 100% code coverage, okay? So you get 100% code coverage, everything is good, in production, everybody's happy. And then somebody goes, maybe intentional, maybe by accident, somebody goes and changes the return type of this function so it returns a string or atom, okay? Now you can have a bug in here, right, because you can get an atom into a string split, right? And string split's not going to like that. It's going to crash, okay? And maybe your tests, all the values that are passing, none of them is going to trigger the code path of another function that returns an atom. So what can happen in this case, if all the arguments that you pass in your tests, right, all of them return a string, what is going to happen is that you have your tests still pass, you still have 100% code coverage, but there can be a bug lurking in here, right? And maybe you're going to find that, maybe it's not a bug at all, maybe never the argument that you pass is going to trigger it, but maybe you're going to find out in production because somebody passed an argument that, uh, that triggered this, right? With a type system, the type system would actually tell you like, hey, you know, like this thing is returning an atom, but a string split cannot handle this atom, and you should look at it, right? 
And for me personally, right, when we are asking about like, what is the value that we could potentially get from a type system, right? For me, this is it, right? Because when we think about types as proofs, what is a type system proving us? It's proving that all of the values, uh, all of the types, sorry, all the types that we can pass to another function, another function can handle it, right? So it's proving that, it's going to prove that's true for us. And it's also going to prove that all the types that another function can return, our code is going to handle it. That's the guarantee that it is giving us, right? And I think that's what, that's when people say, hey, we want a static type system, that's what they're looking for, okay? And, and the reason why this matters is because those scenarios where something is returning something that you did not expect, they become increasingly common the more complex your applications grow the more dependencies you have, right? As code evolve, right? As the code base evolve, the chance of this happening starts to grow or as you are changing the code, as you are refactoring. So having the type, having a type system that can tell you early on, the feedback is also important, but having a type system that can, and having a type system that can tell you early on, like, hey, the, there is potentially a bug in here. Maybe there isn't, but there's potentially a bug in here and you get that before you have to run your whole test suite, before CI kicks in, having that feedback so you can look at it and, and try to make sense of it. That, I think that's what, for me, that's what is valuable, and I think that's what uh, people are looking for, right? So sometimes say, hey, it catches fewer bugs, right? And I, and I don't think saying it catches fewer bugs encapsulate the whole story. I think this encapsulates the, 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 the important story. And the other way is also true. When we have a, like, something like a type specification, right? You are saying, look, I want a type system that guarantees that my function can actually handle all of those inputs, right? And, it's, and that my output conforms to what I declared as an output. Anyway, long story short, short, code coverage catches all bugs that types do? No, I think it's false. But there is a very funny property uh, about this claim, okay? that I want to go through, which is that, remember, when we had this code, code coverage was 100%, and code coverage would actually catch all the bugs that a type system uh, would find, right? Because another function was only returning a string. So at this moment, the claim was true, and the only reason we were able to make the claim false is because we, we have a type system where you can say, hey, I want to return a string or atom. But here's the catch. Not all type systems allow you to do that. Not all type systems allow you to say, look, uh, this function is going to return the union of two existing types. Many type systems allow you to say, hey, I have the union of two new types, but you can't do the union of two existing types. And when we added this union, uh, that's when we went to the scenario where there is now a bug that a type system would catch, but code coverage would not. So the interesting property is that, um, Code coverage can actually catch all the bugs in a type system. Uh, uh, sorry, code coverage can actually catch all the bugs in a type system as long as you have a simple type system in place restricting the kind of code that you write. Right? So what I mean is that if you have like a simple type system, you cannot express concerns like this anymore, right? And then code coverage is enough. Right? So it's this funny situation where code coverage can can replace a type system as long as you have a type system in place, like uh, limiting the language that you can write. And I think, which means that, you know, in, if to replace code coverage you need a type system, then you can't replace code coverage, right? Sorry, if to replace a type system, Jesus. If you replace, if to replace a type system with code coverage, you need to have a type system, then it means that code, uh, code coverage cannot replace it as well, right? But it's interesting to think about this because, again, like, there are some cases where you can only write this. In, in, in some programming languages, you can only write this. You cannot write a string or atom. And this brings another point that not a lot of people talk about, which is types and restrictions, right? When we are talking about type systems, nobody talks like, hey, sometimes some programming languages, they have a type system, and the goal of that type system is to be simple because it wants to restrict the kind of code that you can write. You can try to write something that for you is like, hey, this is completely logical, right? This makes total sense to me. And the type system is like, no, you cannot write that. And the reason why they do that is because they want you to force, they want to force you to write code in a certain style 
right? And they think, well, if you write code only in that certain restricted style, your code at the end is going to be simpler, right? But also the type systems, they can work as a restrictions because they are powerful, okay? So when we were talking about the Rust type system, right, it, in order to prove all of those things about your code, it requires you to write code in a certain way. And sometimes they're going to say, hey, I want to write it like this, and it may make total sense to you, but the type system, I can't understand your code like this. And if I can't understand it, I can't prove the properties that you want me to, so you cannot write the code like that, right? So a lot of the times, the types are also playing the role of restricting the language, okay? In order for proofs, in order to prove something, in order to achieve simplicity, and other reasons. So why would we want static types? Okay, so here is my final shit for this, right? Like so, um, performance and specification is no, documentation uh, and design tool and proofs are yes, and I put code and maintenance in yellow because it, again, saying that, oh, it helps me catch bugs uh, is not necessarily useful unless we understand what are the types of bugs, and that's what the proofs are going to tell us, right? So for me, this is, would be the, the two main points, right? It's because it, it proves something about our code, in particular how it can manage some types, and we want that to happen, to happen quick, in a, to be precise, right, with good error messages, so on and so forth. And there is a new one that we kind of added now, right? Types and restrictions. But here is the question. Would we want to restrict like the idioms that we have in the Elixir language today? Right? I yeah. I trust the core team. I trust the core team. I, yeah, so, so for me, like the answer is no, right? And it's not like I'm tooting my own horn because all like almost all the semantics that we have in Elixir, they came from Erlang, right? That would work at the type level. So, but I'm really happy with it. And that's why Elixir exists, because I was really happy with the semantics in Erlang and I wanted that, right? So yeah, I wouldn't want to have types as restrictions. So this is kind of like the blueprint. This is the challenge, right? If somebody says, hey, we want static types in Elixir, like this is what it's supposed to achieve, okay? All right, so that's it talking about types, I think. Um, so did I change somebody's mind? Did somebody say, hey, I, I wanted a type system before, but I was oversold and I don't want it anymore? Did, if somebody, if I change somebody's mind, please raise your hand in this talk. Yeah, and did somebody say, hey, I, didn't, I did not want types before, but I want it now? Okay, so it seems I didn't change many minds. <laughs> um, but that's not the point, right? The point is that we, at least we are all on the same page, right? So now when somebody says, hey, you know, there are types, and they're like, okay, this is what we're supposed to get. And no, you cannot write fewer tests if you have types, right? And so forth. So, now I can finally talk about my future with Elixir. Uh, hopefully the elephant has been uh, led out of the room and we can move forward. So there are three main areas of focus. And uh, the first one is set theoretic types for Elixir. The second one is developer and learning experience. And the third one is machine learning. Again, so these are the things that I'm working on. I'm working on with the Dashbit team and I'm going to expand uh, uh, all those topics, right? So you're thinking like, what is set theoretic types, for example? So let's do this. Okay, set theoretic types. Um, so set theoretic types is precisely what the name means. So is the idea is that you can have types in the language and you can think about types as you think about sets, right? Like you can do the union between them, you can do the intersection between them. Um, the type specs that we have today already have some of those idioms, right? So what it means is that the foundation of the, the types that would be in the language, you can think about all of their properties in terms of sets, right? And I think this is a great way to approach this because uh, the fundamental set operation is something that uh, we learn early on and we can familiarize with quickly. So uh, set theoretic types, I like them because they naturally map to how we think about Elixir code. So again, this is a type spec, right? But makes total sense to how we think about set theoretic types too. So I can say, look, I have a file read function that receives a path, and it can return two things, a tuple with okay and, uh, and, bi and a binary, or a tuple with the atom error and any other atom, okay? And this or here is a union, right? If I think about sets, or you can do unions, intersections, difference, right? This is a union, 
right? And what is really interesting as well is that the atom OK here, this is a value in the Alexa programming language, right? This is what we write in our code. And we are used to use those values as types. Again, this is not something that all type systems or all types mechanisms can do, the ability to express values as types. And this is called a singleton type, which is something that we can easily express as satiratic types as well. So a natural map to how we think about Elixir code. But the opposite is also true. Elixir code naturally maps to set operations. So uh, when we define a function with multiple clauses, we are actually defining an intersection. So for example, imagine that we have a function example that receives one argument and we say it's an integer and it returns something. And we imagine that we have another clause for this function uh, that receives an atom and returns something, maybe something else. We can think of this as a function that takes an integer and we're, sorry, we can think of this as a function that takes an integer to return something and takes an atom to return something. This and here is an intersection. The fact that it can do both of those things at the same time, right? You don't choose one or the other. This function can always do both. So this is an intersection. Does this mean that now we have to think about fun uh, function clauses as intersections? No, it doesn't mean, it doesn't change any of the way we think about it. The goal is exactly that it maps naturally, so we don't have to change how we think or reason about those things, right? And it's also the direction that type systems such as flow, type and racket, TypeScript are moving to. They start with unions, and now they are adding intersections and similar properties. And uh, they are going to that direction. So I think if we start studying and exploring, and we can start at the, the, at the destination, right? It can be really interesting. So with this in mind, I have one announcement to make, which is that we have a PhD student, PhD scholarship, to research and develop set theoretic types for Elixir. This is uh, the, we have the, uh, this project is, is led, is, sorry, this project, who is working on this project is Guillaume Duboc, uh, Guillaume Duboc uh, the PhD student, Giuseppe, Giuseppe Castanha, Professor Giuseppe Castanha, who is also a senior research and the main designer, the main mind uh, behind set theoretic types. And I am also participating on the project, uh, supervising from the Alexa side. And this project is happening, this scholarship is happening thanks to a couple entities. It's a partnership between the CNRS, and the CNRS is the National Center of Scientific Research in France. And it's the, big fundamental si the biggest fundamental science agency in Europe. So we are bringing the big guns and remote.com. And it is sponsored by Supabase, Fresha, and Dashbit. So I want to just appreciate a little bit uh, those companies that. <laughs> I want to thank them for stepping in and making this happen. And, uh, and, and I'm almost sure that all three of remote, Supabase, and Fresha, they are hiring, and Fresha, we heard from them today. They have a stand here, so you can go talk to them, check it out. You can thank them for their contributions. And with this in mind, right, what do we want, right? So we talk a lot about types, how we could potentially want, right? So let's recap, what we want. We want a type system that proves our code works on their specified types, right? That was an example, like, oh, all the inputs that we give, that code can handle. All the outputs that we get, that code can handle, right? We want improved developer experience, right? If, the, if it takes too long to run, right, the type system, and takes as long as my tests, I might as well run my tests, right? What is the point? Um, and we don't want to restrict Elixir idioms, okay? So this is what we want. But it's also important to talk about the things that we are not going to get, okay? So we're not going to get typing of message passing. The goal is to focus on the functional Elixir side, on the sequential Elixir side, so none of the concurrency aspects, at least not originally. But it's also important to understand that we may not get anything at all, okay? It's very important, like this is a, it's a research project, right? It's, it's a long road. Other people have tried to add type system to Erlang and we may fail. I'm excited with what we have done so far and it may fail. So I don't want the takeaway to be like, 
uh, oh, Elixir is going to be typed in three years. I'm going to throw all my code out and I'm going to wait until that happens, right? No, it may not happen at all. You may wait a long time. It may happen in two years. It may happen in five years. It may happen in 10 years. But it may not happen at all, right? But even though it may not happen at all, we already have an idea of how, if we do get it, how we would get it. We already have a roadmap. And the first one is to map the Elixir language features to set theoretic types. This is what we are working on. So we are looking at Elixir and say, oh, for example, function clauses, oh, that's an intersection. And then we look at all the different idioms, guards, and say how we would model this with set theoretic types, right? So we want to find gaps in Elixir, gaps in the theory, and make sure that we can make those things fit. After we do this and we are confident that, hey, you know, this is pretty solid, we want to start implementing basic set theoretic types inference in your Elixir code. What this means is, is that we are going to add set theoretic types to Elixir, and we are going to look at all of the information. I like to say that Elixir code is very assertive because we have pattern matching and guards. So the goal here is to look at all the information that we have in pattern matching, that we have in guards. We want to look at that and start in try to see if we can find a bug in your code without you changing anything in your code at all. So at, at those points here, at those stages, you're not changing your code. We want you to get the benefits uh, without imposing any, any friction or any work on the community. And this is a work that Eric has already started of setting up the foundation so we can do like this basic inference. So we want to continue that, we want to improve that. And this is important because we are going to be able to measure performance, and then if performance is really bad, we are just going to remove it, right? And you never have to change a single line of code. We can try to improve their home messages, we are going to make them great without you having to change your code. So the whole idea is to get as many feedback, as much feedback as possible, um, without imposing anything on the community. Everything just happens behind the scenes. Then if this works, we are happy, then we are adding set theoretic type structs. So the first place that I think right now, this may change, right? But the, what I think right now, that the first thing that you're going to be able to annotate with set theoretic types, and it's going to be very similar to the experience that we have today with type specs. But the first thing that I want us to annotate is the structs, because I think the combination of pattern matching, guards, and the structs is going to help us prove a lot about your code. And then if this all works out, then you're going to come in with everything that you can possibly type. You're going to go with functions, behaviors, and you're going to get the full, complete experience. And we are here. We are mapping Elixir language features to set theoretic types. And I have to say that I am really happy of working with Guillaume and uh, Professor Giuseppe Castanha because um, I think it can be a really great opportunity of having like academy and industry working together, and we're able already to find challenges like typing of words, like how are going to model all of the interesting constructs in words. And sometimes you're like, oh, we have to type the word is function. And we would have like a six hour meeting talking only about that, right? And try to understand what are all the implications of that. So for, and then we had challenges like handling of functionality. So in Elixir, uh, as we all know, functions are identified by name and arity, and the arity is a particular aspect that we have to consider in the theory, right? So we, have, we made improvements to, towards that. And something else that, is, um, that happens in Elixir and other dynamic languages is that uh, the dual nature of maps dictionaries, right? So in Elixir, we can use maps as records, which means that we define the keys up front and we always update the keys. We never add or remove keys. That's what you would use as a gen server state, for example. But you can also use them as dictionaries where you just put whatever you want in there, right? So how can we model those things under set theoretic types? It's a recent development that we had. So um, that's it. That's what I want to talk about types. For you, if you are like type curious, you can uh, reach, uh, read this paper uh, from Giuseppe Castanha, Programming with Union Intersection Negation Types. It's meant to be a more um, academic paper. It's actually funny how I reached out with Giuseppe for the first time because uh, I was reading about types um, before sleeping, as one naturally does. And then, <laughs> and then I was reading this paper and I was like, oh, I was reading the paper, like, oh, this is perfect. This would exactly map to the problems we have to solve in Elixir, right? A paper that he wrote. And then he's like, okay, 
Uh, this is the problem that we have, to so we have to solve, and in this paper we show how we are going to solve it, and then I read the second section, and I was like, yeah, this makes sense, and then in the third section, it went into mathematics to prove the problem and how it can be solved, and it never came back, and I was like, wait, uh, it never came back from the math, from the proof, so I was like, wait, I have no idea how I would actually implement this. So I sent him an email like, hey, you know, uh, I read your paper, I didn't understand it, and, um, <laughs> And, and, you know, like, maybe we should talk. And he, he, he was, yeah, let's talk. He was actually excited about that. And then he said that there's this paper which uh, I would most likely understand. And, now I've, I, I, and I read it, and it's a great introduction to show how you can program with satirotic types and what are the benefits that it brings. All right, so I'm running out of time. Uh, so for the other two things, the, the main, as you imagine, at this point, as you can see at this point. The goal of this talk was to talk about types, uh, but there are other things that I'm really passionate about and we have been working on intensively, so I'm just going to mention them and it's going to be for another keynote to break it down, okay? So developer learning experience, um, it's something that we have been working on the last uh, one year, one year and a half. So one of the things that we did, for example, was to start working on Livebook, uh, which is, a application for writing inter interactive and collaborative code notebooks in Elixir. And if you don't know what is a code notebook, it's this weird mash between a readme, uh, interactive Elixir shell, and an editor, right? And um, what is really great about Livebook is that we are hoping this can lower the barrier for somebody to start learning Elixir. Because today, if somebody wants to learn Elixir, and especially somebody who has little to no uh, programming experience under their belt, okay? Because, for example, if you want to get started with Elixir today, you have to tell somebody, hey, you know, like, go to the website, install Elixir, install a, uh, an editor, and then potentially go to the command line so you can run these commands, right? So for somebody who is starting, those steps can add a lot of friction. And we are working, and so we have been working on Livebook for one year and a half. Jonathan, who has been leading the project, he's here at the event. And uh, what we are working next, one of the features that we're working next is Livebook Desktop. So you can like just next, next, finish and get Livebook running on your machine with Elixir and already start like doing something with Elixir, building something and getting visual feedback. Livebook, we try to be very visual whenever we can with uh, representations. So I think this can be a great tool and we are already starting to see some efforts like Dockyard Academy that is going to be leveraging Livebook for uh, teaching Elixir. And we have also been focusing on the developer experience all together, especially when it comes to IDEs. So Elixir 1.13 is started a trend of bringing some ID, IDE concerns into Elixir core itself to make the IDEs easier to maintain and better. And Dashbit has also hired Lukas Samsung, who is one of the maintainers of Elixir Sense and of the language server protocol to work part-time on IDEs. So we can have Ukash, Jonathan from Livebook, myself, all working together and try to improve the cycle and bring better tools. And I also want to thank the community. Uh, Elixir, uh, Elixir, GitHub had, had for a while this feature called code navigation, where you could mouse over like a function call or a function definition and see potentially where those things have been defined. And Elixir recently got support for code navigation on GitHub, and this was an effort led by the community. And before this, the only languages in GitHub that had code navigation support were languages where GitHub themselves, they added support for it, and Elixir was the first language where the community went there, implemented all the features, and with the help of the GitHub team, we were able to put it uh, live in production for everybody. So really a uh, great job from the community here. Thank you. And finally, machine learning. Again, I've already used all of our coffee break time, so we won't have time to go into this. Uh, but machine learning, we have been working on this also for a year and a half. A lot has happened. I won't have time to cover those things. But I just want to give you a very quick rundown of like the, the main stars of the show. So we start with an X, which stands for numerical elixir, and we have the mascot, uh, the numbat. And with an X, what we have is what we call multidimensional arrays, also known as tensors. 
And why do you need multidimensional arrays? So for example, when you think about the image, when you're going to represent it as a data structure, you can think as a three-dimensional array where you have the, the height, you have the width, and then you have the channels like RGB, and that's the other dimension. So you have like three channels or four channels. So with an X, we can model those, those higher dimensional uh, concepts efficiently. And not only that, NX has this idea of compilers that can get your Elixir code and run it on the GPU, right? So I've already said this at this point a hundred times, I'm going to say a thousand times more, but it still blows my mind that we can get Elixir code and compile it to run on the GPU, right? And on top of NX, Sean, uh, who also is leading the NX project, he started Exxon, and Exxon is, um, also with the numbat, by the way, Jim, not your dog. Um, and Exxon is a neural network library in Elixir. But the important thing here is that Exxon is all written in Elixir. It's not like I say, oh, you write the things and we are like shelling out to Python or invoking something in C, invoking something in Rust. No, we actually write all the Exxon code is written in Elixir and X gets that code and compile it to run on the GPU. And we also have uh, Explorer which brings data frames to Elixir. So data frames is a fancy way for saying tables, right? So it's tables, like a table where you can think from the database. And the thing about Explorer is having, uh, its API is inspired by a R library called DeepLayer, which is used a lot for data analysis. And the idea is that because when they're thinking about machine learning, often we have to, or numerical computing even, we have to work with large amount of data, we have to get the data from the database, we have to prepare it, do a bunch of changes to it. And the idea of Explorer, it uses as one of the backends, uh, something called Polars, which is implemented in Rust. So it can do that really, really fast. So, you know, there is already a lot of uh, exciting things happening in here that you can already do. There are some people already using this in production, and I'm thinking we are going to hear a uh, couple more cases, it's still this year. There are some papers that are going to be soon published about all the work that we are doing here. So a lot of things, again, I could go a whole talk, but what I will do is that I want to leave us with this video um, that uh, Yuisho Takafuji recently shared with us in the machine learning working group, where he was able to get uh, pre-trained uh, machine learn uh, models, load them into a Phoenix app, with live view and start running inference. So you can see he puts an image and he, he chooses one of the many existing machine learning models and he'd say, oh yeah, it's a bird. And it's particularly the, the bee eater bird and what are the, the most likely possibilities. So a very quick example of using uh, part of this tooling and this is really just the beginning of what we'll be able to do really, really soon. Thank you very much.